actually standing on a wobbical country on Ash Island at the Kooragang wetlands area. This area is really important and very significant to the local Aboriginal community, but it's just as important to the Waramai people to the north of us. Um, the Waramai people and the Awabikal people actually use this area as a shared area, very rich in bush tucker, bush medicine. Kooragang sits in the estuary of the Hutter River. It's within 10 minutes easy drive of Newcastle and the Lower Hunter is a major population area so it's almost half a million people around this area. But Kooragang has a long history. It uh, was uh, first settled in the early 1800s and a number of the early explorers came through the Hunter. I recall reading some material early on where the people from the US who were prospecting the area for possible steel mills and various other activities thought that the wetlands were a vast opportunity because you could have all these easy waste disposal sites. It was actually said the islands as lungs for industry but we see and I saw the devastation of dumping polluted soil and the general degradation. When I saw it in 1962, it was like a moonscape. I learned a very important thing from my dad. They were hard times for lots of people around the world and in Australia, and he made himself a smokehouse out of an old tank, and he was opening fish to smoke them, and they were full of tar. And he was very angry, and he looked across at the steelworks, because the river then was being polluted with tar and oils. He said, they're killing the river and I've never forgotten that. The Hunter River Estuary is the home of one of the largest coal loaders in the world, and it's also the home of an internationally significant wetland. The Green Corridor around the western fringe of Newcastle is just a magnificent natural resource that is a great counterpoint to the developed and the industrial area of Newcastle. Fifteen years ago, there was a group of concerned government and community members who got together, created a committee, and they started to put together an assessment and a management plan. And uh, with the development of that plan, the committee realised they needed, I guess, an umbrella organisation under which that they could operate. And it was launched as a compensation project to help redress the loss of habitat due to draining and filling and clearing over the previous 200 years. And that's really the whole basis for the project was an integrated project to help redress the loss of that habitat, but also to provide a resource for the local people and the local community so that they could enjoy the area and therefore appreciate it and therefore look after it. As a biologist, I'm constantly amazed at the resilience of this system. So for as much modification as it's gone through, it's so responsive to a little bit of tender loving care and a little bit of time that the productivity of it is just incredible. We have this wonderful resource that we have on this site, which is a species list from 1862. The first land grant owner that lived out here, his daughters were professional natural history artists, Helena and Harriet Scott. And Helena Scott left us with a list of about 240 species of what was growing on this site before it was cleared. And that's given us a huge amount of information for the island, which now forms the basis of the work that uh, we're doing in terms of the rehabilitation of this area. On a landscape level, you have a whole mosaic of vegetation types in areas like this that together make a remarkably productive system. You have the mosaic with an intertidal areas, which is the open water, mangrove, salt marsh, fringing areas around the salt marsh. And then on slightly higher ground, you'll get some upland floodplain forest vegetation types and then in the midst of those floodplain forest types you'll have swales that collect rainwater and they provide a freshwater element to the system. Mangroves and salt marsh grow together normally in an estuarine system. Very small changes in elevation and the way that the tide water comes in will usually dictate where you get mangroves and where you get salt marsh. So in a natural system, the closest to the source of the tide you'll get a strip of mangroves. Then behind that, 
the tide may only come up once or twice a month or once or twice a year even further up and that's usually where you'll get salt marshes. Over time, salt marsh, especially in um, southeastern Australia, has declined rapidly and it's basically because of human influence. Because they do look like wastelands and nobody thinks they're attractive, they have been filled in to be used for parks, agricultural land, industry, you name it. A range of creatures that live in salt marshes are invertebrates that live within the sediments and they can feed a lot of these big shellbirds and also fish. If the salt marsh is uh, close to a tidal area, fish will come in and feed on a lot of the snails and crabs that live within the salt marsh. Mangroves are generally very important in an estuarine system. They function as a nursery area for a lot of commercial fish species and prawn species. So they find food and they also get protection whilst they're in here. That's their real importance to the fishing industry. But they also stabilise the banks and they're the only big trees that will grow in a saline environment. So they are often called the lungs of the estuary as well. This project has delivered a wonderful natural resource to the local community and really to the international community because we look after migratory species that come from the northern hemisphere. We're very fortunate here to be situated right beside a Ramsar site. The Ramsar Agreement affects wetlands right around the world, an international agreement for the protection of those wetlands primarily for the benefit of the migratory birds that use one wetland one season and move to another country for the next season. We have a land area of some 2,000 hectares adjoining our land that is a Ramsar site. The Hunter region is a very special place for birds and it has about 430 species in the Hunter region. The Stockton Sandspit itself has a limited number of birds. The birds that like to come to the Stockton Sandspit are larger shorebirds such as the Bartail Godwit. And the Bartail Godwit in the last two years has become very famous for its documented journeys between the Southern Hemisphere and the Northern Hemisphere. And they are a species which makes a journey of 11,000 kilometres in one flight. They fly from Alaska to New Zealand and the east coast of Australia. We've recorded 27 threatened species on site on Ash Island, which is 780 hectares. And so as a biodiversity outcome, this is huge. We've planted over 150,000 trees, mostly with volunteer labor. We've now established a canopy, probably over about three kilometers across the island. And birds, like black-faced monarch and rufous fantail, are only here because the forest is here. And we're looking forward to having a lot more of those species that John and Elizabeth Gould recorded in the 1800s that were linked to these floodplain forests. The way forward from here is from this really firm foundation that's been established over the previous 15 years. One initiative is the Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Plan that will be worked on by the local people and that will be a really important part of the future of the site. The outstanding achievement of this project has been the level of community awareness and engagement that's been achieved. And people are now thoroughly and comprehensively aware of wetland values and of the links between biodiversity values and fishing habitat and prawn habitat and so on. And they actually have a link between what comes on their dinner plate and what they actually see as they drive down the Pacific Highway at Hexham. Honey Sandra's an awabical elder of ours and we brought her out here for the 15th birthday of the Kurugan wetlands and Honey Sandra hadn't been back here for 40 years and she walked on the ground and she just went off on her own and um, she said it was like coming back home again and she just felt like a kid and she wanted to go swimming in the wetlands and to have that sense of connection and that love that she continues to have for the land is something that's really important for us as Aboriginal people to witness. Um, you can't describe that belonging and connection.